So, Father, I just thank you for today. I honor you and I bless you. I thank you that Helen is not who stands before them, but Holy Spirit is who you shall see. I thank you now, Father, that you begin to open up the hearts of your people that are here today, that they can hear what the Spirit has to say, and their ears that they will listen. We give you honor and we give you glory and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I know sometimes uh, people that are married, they um, thank their wife and their husband. I don't have one of those. But I want to say to my little mini-me who is away at school, Kiki, who's watching, Mommy, I love you. Mommy loves you. All right, so I just want to give you this little precursor. So if you start to feel something rise up your back, a little pinch on your side, something coming up your throat, it's okay. It's just that deliverance is about to take place. Amen. I believe the people that are supposed to be here on this morning are here because God has something that he desires to speak to you today. So we have been in a series called The Return to see so many different speakers come up here and provide a different perspective of one, one chapter. Luke 15, we've heard it all different kind of ways. And I believe that how God wants to bring it to you today will bring deliverance, not just to your mind, but to your heart and to your soul. Amen? So we know that in Luke 15, Jesus uses parables in three different ways. It's the lost coin, right? It's the lost sheep, and it is the lost son. So we know that the younger son wanted his money, his inheritance from his father, and he wanted it now. He didn't want to wait. What am I going to wait for? You're not dead. I'm going to get too old. You might take too long, and I might not be able to enjoy the fruit of your labor. Right? So the father obliged and he gave him his inheritance. So we're going to start at Luke 15, verse 13 through 19. Now this is after the son got what he wanted. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. This is the NLT version. And there he wasted all his money on wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, Self, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. Now go down to Luke 25 through 28. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants, what's going on? Your brother is back, is what he told him, and your father has killed the fattened calf, and we are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. The title of the message today is, What About Me? Now tell me, how is it you have these two brothers that grew up in the same household, right? They shared the same father. They would do the same inheritance. They plowed the fields. And they had the father's love equally, but yet they came out with different perspectives. It's the same way that you can grow up in a house with your siblings. You all can live in a house together, experience the same thing, but come out with two different views. You know why? Because all, it's all about how you receive, how you process, and how you apply. Right? So the irony is, is that these two brothers, even though they shared the same thing, they also shared the same dysfunction. What was that dysfunction? They both shared a spirit of discontentment in two different ways, right? So discontentment means a lack of satisfaction with one's possessions, status, or situation, a sense of grievance, or a feeling of dissatisfaction. The word dis means not. The word content means a state of peaceful happiness. When you combine them together, it means not a peaceful happiness or a peaceful place. So both of these brothers were discontent, but they were discontent in two different ways. 
the younger brother was discontent in his flesh. He was ready to party and kick it and party and kick it. He was ready to do what he wanted to do, right? He wanted to submit to his desires instead of the will of the father, instead of tra tradition. So what happened is, is that when he decided to go and do what he wanted to do, he took off his garments of righteousness. And when you take off your garments of righteousness, you are no longer standing in truth. The second thing is, he desired to become anonymous. He wanted to get away from who he actually was. He forgot who he belonged to. The third thing is, that he wanted to live his life like it was golden. Without the thought of any consequences or repercussions. So what happens is, that the law of sowing and reaping came into full effect in his life. So here's what happened. Because he didn't want to feel like he was boxed in. He didn't want to feel like he was missing out on something or being able to enjoy life like everybody else that he was seeing afar off. He desired to give into his flesh. And it caused him to seek after something that he was never meant to possess. So like that son where your desires are no longer in alignment with God's will, you are only going to see through the eyes of your wants. So then your vision becomes blurred. You can't see what God is leading you. You can't see what God is taking you. You don't see the Holy Spirit moving on your behalf. Your vision is blurred, right? You process things, your thoughts, through limited understanding. Your wisdom is obstructed. You can't think of whatsoever is good and lovely and of good rapport. You're thinking about how my flesh needs to be fed, how I want to do what I want to do. But you got to understand that when you feel like you are doing things behind the scenes and man can't see you, God is always watching. And then what happened is he started operating from the panting of his flesh. Do you know that your flesh can pant that it calls out, I want this, I want that. I want him, I want her, I want this drink, I want this smoke. And when your flesh starts to pant, right, you find yourself in unwelcoming, altering um, predicaments. You find yourself in a place where you were not meant to be. But most importantly, you find yourself in a place without God. Who wants to find themselves in a place without God? Especially if you're a believer of God. If you say, Abba, Father, I belong to you, but yet you give in to the desires of your flesh, who do you really belong to? Ask yourself this question. What are you discontent about at this point in your life? What has you ready to walk away, give up, turn your back, not come back, curse somebody out, let them know how you feel, Is it trying to draw you from a place of safety and lead you to a place of loading bar? What's going on? What has you fantasizing to the point that you just can't hold on no more? I gotta have what I see. I gotta do what I want. You have to understand this. Every inward, ungodly desire. I'm going to say that again. Every inward, ungodly desire produces public humiliation. I want you to take a minute and stop and think about that. Think about what you've been discontent about. And how inwardly those desires can cause public humiliation if you act on them. See, the enemy desires to take those points of that humiliation, right, to bring you to a place of dishonor. 
The son dishonored himself, he dishonored his father, and he dishonored his family. When you get to that place where your flesh and your inward desires rule you, you've dishonored God. I can't keep my hands to myself, whether they on somebody else or on me. I can't keep my mind from thinking on the things of Christ because my thoughts are afar off. And when the enemy wants to dishonor you, what he wants to do then at that point is clothe you in shame. Not just a shirt, but he's going to put the whole coat on. So then when you out there doing what you do and you see one of the saints, it's like, hey, how you doing? Or you try to act like you don't see him. You know how we do the same thing we do in church when you don't want to talk to nobody? You turn your head like you're busy or getting your phone. And if he can clothe you in shame, the ultimate goal is to get you to rebel from God. That is what the enemy is after, you to rebel from God. Because here's the thing, premature movement is a sign of an immature mentality. I say that again. Premature movement is a sign of an immature mentality. Mentality. Here's the thing with fleshly sin. There's always triggers before the fall. So this younger man wanted an inheritance, right? That was due. He couldn't wait for it. Trigger number one, impatience. And impatient behavior leads to a destructive outcome. Because you are going to move before time. You are going to move ahead of God. You are not learning how to wait. And when you don't learn to wait on God, then how can you receive the real reward that you are supposed to get? Right? He wasted his money on kicking it, turning up. He was all good. Until he was left with no thing, no thing, except his own foolish desires, his own foolish devices. Trigger number two, when you adhere to your flesh, there is a lack of restraint. It causes you to make unconscious decisions that produce, that don't produce fruit. Trigger number three, he took a job that was beneath his stature. So what happens is, is that you lower your standards to appease your flesh. So what have you lowered your standards to? It ain't necessarily got to be sex. What about food? What about your attitude? What about your thoughts that people can't see but God knows? You got to realize this. When you come from under the will of God, you then become your own master and live according to your own devices versus his directives. And when you do that, you willingly, you willingly remove yourself from the Father's presence, his promises, and his provisions. You left to fend for yourself. Anybody ever been in a place where they had to fend for themselves? How difficult was that? How hurtful was that? All right? So the resolve is, this young man had an aha moment. The eyes of his understanding were enlightened. And he had to humble himself and return home. Where's joy? And so what happened is, is that in verse 20, when the young man was returning home, the father saw him afar off. Is that my boy? Is he coming back home? But here's the thing. While he was coming back home, think about what was going on on the inside of him. Self-condemnation, self-pity, self-doubt. Will my father really receive me back? After all I've done, after all I've said, 
But not only that, think about the people that were around him in the town. He's so dumb, he had it all. He's so stupid, why he ever leave? He get what he deserved. But what the father did was, he saw him, and he said, my son. And he extended his hand. And when he extended his hand, that was a sign of forgiveness. But then what he did next was a blessing because what he did was that he clothed him in a robe. And what that robe represented was the father's approval, his restoration, and his protection that he was placing back over his son. The next thing he did was he placed a ring upon his finger. You got to understand what a ring meant. It was a symbol that was placed because now he's in a place of authority. Now this was somebody that went according to his own devices, but he humbled himself. He repented and he returned home. And so now, not only did his father place honor and authority upon him, but his God placed honor and authority upon him. The next thing that he had was his sandals. Because see, what happened was he returned home as a slave and as a servant, and they didn't wear shoes. They couldn't afford them. So then what happened is, is that the father placed sandals on his feet. And it was a sign that you are no longer a slave or a servant. You have been restored to an heir of the throne. And that's good. We see the restoration of the younger son. But what about the older one? The oldest son dealt with discontentment in his heart. It's easy to see the discontentment on the younger son because it was physical. But what about when it's discontentment in your heart that only you and God know about? But here's the thing, you think nobody else can see it, but it's very visible. And so what happened is, is that the discontentment in the son's heart caused him to be bitter, angry, and jealous. So come on, older son. So let me read the verse, verse 28. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go into the party. The father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years, you know when you get mad and you really let that stuff come out? All these years, I've slaved for you, and you never once gave me a single thing or told me that you were grateful. And in all that, all that time, you never even gave me one young goat or had a party for me and my friends. Yet when this son of yours, listen to that, that righteous indignation, when this son of yours comes back after squandering all his money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing a fattened calf? His father said to him, look, dear son, you always stay with me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother that was dead is now alive. What you think the brother did? If it was me, I would have looked at him like he was crazy. I hear you, but I don't feel you. So the brother's discontentment in his heart came through that sense of grievance, that unfair treatment, feeling disrespected, and feeling devalued. How many of you have ever felt like that in your life? And after all of that, he still remained steadfast, unmovable, always abounding 
and honorable to his father, even though all of this was in his heart. Right? There was a feeling of dissatisfaction. He was unhappy. He was irritated. He was vexed. Because he wanted to do what was right in his own sight. But was it good enough? That's the question. So the condition of your heart, you already know, is a matter of life and death, right? If your heart stop you out of here, if they can't resuscitate you, you also have to understand that where your heart is, is where pain is stored. It's where offense is housed. And so if pain and offense is housed in your heart, in your heart then when offense comes, you put on a defense mechanism, a suit of armor. And the scripture says that when a brother is offended, he is harder to be won than the bars of a castle. What happens when your heart is hardened? You can't forgive easily. You can't hear God clearly. You can't pray effectively. And you can't love genuinely. When your heart is hardened, it becomes obstructed and produces an unhealthy enzyme in your body. So your heart is not the only thing that's infected. Your body becomes infected. Because we know what an infection, it spreads, right? It starts one place, but then it moves to someplace else, right? So then when you experience these pains around your heart and it's obstructed, that means the issues of life are flowing from it. And you can't see past what's in front of you. What happens is then is that your mental capacity is affected. And you can't think upon nothing but your problems. So you can't even open your mind to hear God calling you and beckoning you back. There's weakness in your muscular system because it becomes infected with diseases of resentment, disappointment, and regret. Then it blocks up your arteries, right, with strife, jealousy, and envy. All cause your heart is hardened because you won't forgive, you won't repent for what's in there, and you won't seek the Father to help you cleanse it out. Create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. Right? So then, do you know that when your heart is right, it's not right, that you are double-minded? Because you're being tossed to and fro in your thoughts. Yeah, he loved me but he did this. I tried to help, but they didn't accept it. Should I stay? Because I know that's where I'm supposed to be, but I'm going to go because they not affirming me. They not loving me the way I need to be loved. People were not meant to love you the way that you needed to be loved. God, because God can only get into the crevices of that heart that no man could ever reach. Here's the question. The story, the parable ends, and we never know what happened to the son. We know the younger son was restored, but it never says what happened to the older son. Here's what I believe. I believe that was left that way because it's up to you to make a choice or a decision. There are some things laying on the hands can't do for you. That impartation can't bring you out of. There is a choice that has to be made, right? You got to choose that you are no longer going to serve your pain and stay in a place of defeat. But you've got to flee your own self-destruction. Because that's what happens when your heart becomes hardened. It's self-destructing. You're doing it. Nobody else is doing it to you. We can make excuses about why it's happening, but the choice is yours to allow it to happen. Secondly, you need to decide. You need to decide if you're going to stay in the present place of your pain or if you are going to repent, forgive, and forge forward. 
That's the difficult part, that forging forward. Even if you got a forge and you crawling, if you got a forge and you crying, if you got a forge and you all by yourself, do it. Because you're not crawling back to them, you're crawling back to God. See, what happens is we want edification from man. Man will change on you. He started at 11 o'clock loving you at 1101. It could be a different story. But God's love for you will never change. It will never grow weary. It will never go old. There was nothing that you can do that will cause him to change how he feels about you. So here's the thing. By an act of his own will, the oldest son has to remove the barrier from around his heart. And what I love about this is that there is a time clock on your heart. You don't know the day, the hour, the minute that your number will be up and God calls you home. So why put off tomorrow what you can do today? Why make excuses about why you can't forgive? Why make excuses about why they not worthy of being forgiven? Are you worthy of being forgiven? I'm not going to ask you what you did today. What did you think today? What were your thoughts today? I had to repent this morning. And if you don't repent daily, there is something wrong with you. You may not be physically or naturally in sin, but your mind is a sinful nature because it's always thinking, it's always wanting, it's always desiring. And so what is needed for the son? Restoration to the heart. And so Holy Spirit told me today, is Jasmine here, Jasmine Jones? The Holy Spirit told me today that this message was for people who needed restoration in their heart. Restoration because you have become angry, you have become bitter, you feel like nobody loves you, you feel like nobody cares, you want to give up on that marriage. You want to walk away from everything and everybody. Today, God is calling you back. Not just to a physical place, but in, his, in your heart. You can return to some place physically, but if your heart is not there, you're still gone. And so today, it's restoration time. You all can play. So I want you to just take a moment right now and I want you to be honest with yourself because nobody else knows your thoughts but God. And I want you to be honest if you've had discontentment in your flesh or in your heart. Well, you said, God, I want to trust you, but it's so hard. I can't see a way out. And because I can't see a way out, I'm not going to let anybody in that could help me. God, I want to love again. But you just don't know how much they hurt me. God, I want to trust again. But the way they did me was so wrong. God, I want to be in your perfect will. But I just don't know how. So I'll do it the way I know how. So if you know that you are dealing with any discontentment in your heart now, or you have and there is some residue, or you're facing situations that can harden your heart, I want you to come to this altar. This is not an altar, a, a welcome into the church. This is an opening of the altar.
where nobody's going to lay hands on you. This is you and your relationship with God. You can give him all of your excuses of why. But all that he wants to hear this morning is, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't trust you enough. I'm sorry I didn't think you loved me enough. I'm sorry that I walked away from you in my heart. I'm sorry that I turned my back on you. There is restoration that will happen at this altar on today. That is God's promise. right in the aisle. That's the altar. Altar is where you build it. 